Let us pray. The eternal God of heaven and Father, we come this morning just acknowledging your greatness, realizing you are an awesome God, and we stand in awe of your great might this morning. Realizing that you are creator and sustainer of the universe. We are so grateful for all that you've done for us, and we bow to this thank you especially for Jesus Christ, your son, who came and died on Calvary's cross in order that we might have eternal life. Yes. And we come just asking your blessing upon this assembly this morning, for we ask your blessing upon every individual that gathered here this morning. Yes. And we just pray that you bless each person with good health and long life, and we just ask that you bless those who could not be here this morning because of sickness. And we just pray that you strengthen them and enable them to come together at the next appointed time. We just pray, Heavenly Father, that you will help us to all to come together uh, in a timely manner so that we can do things orderly and be unified in everything that we do in the worship yes. service. We just ask your blessing upon our young people this morning. We pray that you will help them as they, as they are around their friends. We pray that you will help them to be strong and, and not be turn aside from the things that you will have to do. We yes. pray that you can help them, to, we'll, we'll help them to be instrumental in bringing their friends unto you. Amen. We just come this morning asking forgiveness of our sins, but we realize that at times when we do things that are contrary to your will and way. Yes. We come asking your blessing upon us, Sister Diane Carlisle, who stood and made a confession this morning. We pray that you bless her. Strengthen her in the areas in which she's weak Amen. and help her to grow and not commit the same errors again. Amen. And we pray that you would help us all to be uh, better citizens in your vineyard. Help us all to grow spiritually because we need help along the way. And we just ask that you would help us to understand better your will and way. Yes. And help us to be able to help someone else. Amen. And we pray this morning for the bereaved everywhere. We yeah. pray that you. Blessed bereaved, we pray for the Montgomery family in particular, who just recently lost a loved one, a great family who lost a loved one recently, and we pray for uh, the Thompson family, and the passion of Brother Thompson, we pray that you would continue to comfort them, help them to be able to continue to move forward, and just pray that all will be well with them. We ask your blessing upon the church everywhere, we pray that you would uh, Love and unity and peace will always prevail in the church. Be with the leaders in every congregation. Help the church to grow. Help the leaders to always have the church interest, best interest at heart. And we pray for our country. We pray for those who are leadership in our country. We pray that you will help them to lead wisely. We know that people are doing any and everything to get the things that they want. We just pray that People will have a greater regard for the things that you require and the things that you demand. And we just pray that you would help us to be at peace with those who are far in land. And we pray that you would help us to just have a strong desire to please you uh, in all that we do. Yes. We pray for our community, so for uh, drugs and violence to uh, run rampant. And we pray for the eradication of those things in order that we have safe neighborhoods and pray that our youngsters will not become involved in those things that are contrary to your will and way. Yes. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you will be with this congregation in particular. Help us to be able to care on. We pray that you will help us to be more effective in reaching out to those who are outside of the body in order that they too uh, may hear the word and, and can obey it before it's eternal and too late. We pray that you be with us all the days of our lives. Forgive us of our sins. And when life here should be no more, we pray that a home in heaven will await us. And in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.
page 67. Everything but 
We're worshiping God. Amen. So if I can, as your brother in Christ, an encouragement unto you, thank you for loving God more than yourself yes. this morning to give him the thanks and praise he so rightly deserves. I don't know about you, but I don't mind sitting among a few saved as opposed to a whole bunch of hypocrites Amen. out there in the world. Because the Bible tells us in Matthew chapter number 7 that narrow is the way. And few there will be that will find each. So I'm more impressed by those that are in the fold, even if there are a few, than a whole lot of folks doing stuff that's contrary to the will of Almighty God. So I say that again to thank you and encourage you for coming out to worship God in spirit and in truth. But most of all, we thank God for him being God, for him creating us, and of course, giving us his son, who suffered, died, and rose again, that all of us would have a chance at eternal life. But I want to challenge us and, 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 and kind of just motivate us more to go to the next level. So everything I'm talking about this morning applies to me, just like it applies to you. If I can humbly ask you, let's go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6 and verse number 7. As you do that, I want to welcome you if it's your first time visiting here at Henry Street. Well, again, as our elder has said earlier, I want to let you know you're our guest. And I want you to come back and worship and fellowship with us once again. If you're so inclined, of course, put out the visitor's card. That's not required by any form or fashion. We just do that so we can put a faith in the name and announce you later if you elect to do just that. Of course, I, uh, I am encouraged by my wife's presence and her baby and me all week, all that after surgery. <laughs> you know you got a good one when she put up with you. And you're really kind of incapacitated in some ways. But thank God for her continued love and her support. And when rubber meets the road, I don't know about you, but sometimes when your spouse gets sick, folk leave. <laughs> Amen, now. Amen. So if you got one that's stick in there, which you better appreciate her. And as, as Gerald LeBurk would say, baby, hold on to me. Amen. <laughs> I'm going to hold on to her. You ain't got too many cut like that no more. Amen. <laughs> so I'm going to keep her. It is good to keep her. Amen. Amen. Second Corinthians 9. Verse 6 and verse number 7 out of the King James Verse. Let, let me reread it just to refresh my memory and uh, be in the spirit of all myself. All right, we have somebody say amen. 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 Right, 2 Corinthians 9 verse 6 says, and this is Paul speaking to the church of Christ that met in the town of Corinth, of the town which was in Greece. It says, but this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. And he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Verse 7 says, Every man according as he purposes in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. What I'm talking about is not what we normally use that scripture for. I'm not really talking about money this morning. But I want to take you on a detour and come right back and go make sense of what I'm talking about at the end. But what we're talking about is a subject called the Peace Corps is right here in the church. Amen. The Peace Corps is right here in the church. Now, let's talk about and analyze our world for a moment. There are many charitable organizations out there that are actually doing good works. Now, if you remember the Church of Christ, if you have been in the church long enough, if you have been here for decades, you have to understand that many of our pioneer preachers, they told us some things that were right, but they also told us some things that were not right. Man. And I'm going to show you that from the scriptures. But typically, as we have talked about over the last 50 years, we have been very negative about worldly organizations. Man. Think about it. A lot of times, if I name some names out there right now, you'll cringe. Start saying stuff like Salvation Army. You'll start preaching. Mm -hmm. You start talking about other organizations that do the same thing. We start preaching. Now where our pioneer preachers were right is the fact that they should not have the notoriety they have. They should not be considered the place of compassion. Man. They should not be considered the place that people run to when they need a hot meal. 
They shouldn't be thought of. Amen. Now, I'm going to tell you where I'm going with this in a second. When somebody needs a warm place to stay, they shouldn't be thinking about nobody but the church. Amen. 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 We should be on the forefront of all these works in the world. In other words, anytime people need something, the first thing they should be saying is, I'm going down to the Church of Christ or our local congregation. Amen. And this is where I'm going to find my compassion. Amen. There ought to be somebody down there that can help me when I'm truly in need. I'm not talking about hustlers. I'm not talking about lazy. I'm talking about folks that are in need. They ought to be able to run to the church. Amen. And nobody else. Amen. Now, obviously, our pioneer preachers taught us that. And they were right about that. That is one thing about us. If our works are the way Jesus' works work, we will be that city set on a hill Amen. that will be spotted from afar. That cannot be healed. But where they went wrong, I'm going to tell you this right now, is that they taught us, but they didn't teach us to have love when we teach these things. In other words, we should knock the Salvation Army when they are doing the right thing. Huh? Amen. Think about it now. They are still putting square meals on people's plates. They are giving people a place to stay. We should knock a man when he has good works, whether he's a Christian or not. You always uphold a person when they're doing good, no matter what. Amen, y'all. And that's the problem that we've had historically, that we talk the truth, but we often didn't teach it in love. And we wonder why many people get repelled from us instead of attracted to us. Oh, amen. Now think about it now. Now think about it this way. Also, when you think about places like the Peace Corps, the Peace Corps is, I believe, a government-funded organization. And of course, they go over and do a lot of mission work. They, too, are putting meals on the table. They, too, are teaching people how to do proper farming and irrigation techniques so they can survive in their native lands. They're, these folks many times have to pay their own way in order to do these things. Now, if you tell me now, we have no business knocking them. Mm -hmm. If they're doing the things that we should be doing, amen. oh, amen, amen, in the first place. Amen. It makes us hypocrites in all, and when we actually down folks that are doing the work that we're supposed to be doing in the first place. Amen. Think about it. When we talk about some things, and normally we keep these in the high esteem. I'm glad that we do. And we just gave a donation to them. You think about somebody like St. Jude, the hospital. Now, how many hospitals do you know that you can walk in there with cancer as a child, and they're going to say, well, we don't need Blue Cross and Blue Shield. Huh? We don't need any insurance. We don't even need money out your pocket. If you don't have it, we'll take care of them anyway. And some folks are so ignorant, they are not folk like them. Amen. No, we need to be what? Holding them folk uh, up yeah. because they're doing the work we were commissioned Amen. to do all the time. You see, uh, that's why I look at it this way. If you're not doing it, don't complain. Amen. amen. Otherwise, why? You're being a hypocrite. Amen. Oh, amen. Come on, I'm not talking to anybody amen. here today. So again, the good works of these organizations should never be underestimated. They should never be undervalued, or they should never should be belittled because they are not Church of Christ organizations. In fact, this goes contrary to what many pioneers preachers used to teach us in the church because they were trying, I know what they were trying to do, they're right in one aspect. They were trying to reinforce the good works of the church coming to the forefront instead of these secular organizations leading the way. They were right on that one. But they didn't consider Mark chapter 9, verse 37 to verse number 39. Let me show you how Jesus handled situations like this as the biblical principle and example for us. How we treat people that don't necessarily walk with us. What did Jesus do in that situation? Now, I don't know about you, but I think I got some believers in Jesus in here, right? Amen. And I believe that you, are, you believe fully in Hebrews 4. 
Verse 14 to verse number 16, when Jesus said what? When the Holy Spirit said about Jesus, and put it that way, that he was tempted in all things like us, yet without what? Without sin. And so whatever Jesus did, whatever methodology of him handling other people is right, it's unflawed, it's unperverted, and it's uncorrupted, and we can imitate it at all times in order to be pleasing to God. Y'all over there in Mark chapter 9. Verse 37 to verse 39. When you have it, somebody say, somebody say amen. amen. Now here's what we got. And this is the mentality many people in the church have that John had. Look what it says. And John answered him saying, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name. And he what? He followeth not us. And we forbade him because what? He followeth not us. Y'all see anything familiar there yet? Huh? There was a man out there doing some good works, right? In the name of Jesus. And then John and the apostles said, y'all not with us. You better cut that out. Huh? Who gave John and the apostles the ability to say, hey, you stop doing your good works. Amen. Weren't we all as human beings put on the planet to do good works? Yeah. We were made for the pleasure of God. We were made not to fulfill our desires, but to fulfill the desires of the Lord. And there was a man out there doing innocent and good works, and the apostles was getting on his case Amen. for no reason at all. I'm glad God is faith. Amen, y'all. I'm glad that Jesus stepped in and corrected them for taking on that mentality. Look at verse 39. It says what? That next word changes the direction of thought. It said what? But. B-U-T. All right, John. All right, the rest of the apostles. You put it out there on the plate. Now how is Jesus going to handle what you just said? Look what it says in verse 39. But Jesus said what? Forbid him not. In other words, John, apostles, get out of his way. Huh? He is actually doing the work of the Lord, whether he's working with us or not. Oh, amen, y'all. So what did Jesus say? Oh, let's play politics now, and let's go ahead and satisfy what John and the rest of the apostles said. No. What did Jesus say? He said, but no. Jesus said what? Forbid him not, for there is no man which shall do a miracle in my name that can lightly speak evil of me. So as you can see, Jesus did not knock the works of a man who did not literally walk with him and his disciples as the man was still doing the good work of casting out devils in the name of Jesus. So that this shows us, folks, that when people are doing good, church, leave them alone. Amen. What did Jesus just say? If the man was doing good, what did he say? Forbid them not. Do not get in the way. Because one thing you understand as a church, God can use anybody to bless you. Amen. Whether it's in the church or out the church, God is still in control no matter what. Amen. Oh, amen, somebody. Amen. amen, somebody. And so obviously then, you don't want to burn bridges. You don't have to burn. As you can see, Jesus did not work, they did not knock the works of the man who did not literally walk with him, the disciples, as the man was still doing the good works that God wants us. So again, church, leave folk alone when they're doing good works. See, one thing you have to understand, you do not have to endorse their views. You do not have to participate in the false doctrines. That they're doing. Amen now. Amen. Think about it this way. Some folks will, 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 will be real hypocritical about it. Especially if you're in need of some housing. Man, the church ought to be building what Habitat for Humanity is doing. And they could criticize them, but if Habitat built a house for you, you're going to live in it? Amen. 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 Let's be honest. Let's be honest. There's some things in the church that actually have held the church back. Because it wasn't exactly sound teaching Amen. that we had learned over the last 50 to 80 years that we've been in this 
Preaching. Oh, amen. Huh? Again, that's one reason why you take scripture upon scripture and line upon line and precept upon precept. So remember, at least when a man or a woman is making a difference, you encourage them. You don't throw them away. You see, one thing that you have to understand, and I've done have to tap with humanity and all that kind of stuff, putting up siding on houses and all that kind of stuff. Do you realize that when you are pounding a nail, you can be quoting scripture right next to a person that you wouldn't have encountered before? Huh? If you were not connected with that organization? Oh, amen now. Come on now, somebody. These are opportunities in order to what? To show them the light and the truth. Amen. Oh, amen. amen. By you upholding them and helping them when they are in a time of need. You know, we ought to be the type of church that's always connected with the community. The first name when folks out of the community, I don't even know the Lord, should be Dallas, should be Henry Street, Church of Christ. Amen. We need y'all. You always show up in order to help us. Oh, amen, y'all. Truth be told, if I can really tell you right now, show me a church building Jesus was in. He went. He went to synagogues here and there, preached, but what was Jesus really doing? He was going along the countryside on foot, helping and encountering people. So what does that mean? He was constantly interfacing with the community and not just stuck between what? Four walls. Huh? He was out there even having dinner with Pharisees and scribes, his enemies, guys. Because even some of them later on became Christians. Oh, amen, y'all. Got to think about this. These networking opportunities, they are opportunities for the church, and there's opportunities for the gospel. And we've pigeon-toed ourselves so much as a church that we have become ineffective because we're always hidden in the back of somebody's neighborhood. Don't know about the community. Amen. Know who we are. Because we're not out there doing it amen. like everybody else. Oh, amen, somebody. Amen. It's time to get in the battle. Amen. Oh, we can quote our book, chapter, and verse. That's good. But what about the rest of it? Amen. What about going to the community? What about showing them compassion? What about them saying, hey, I know that church on the corner. Amen. amen. It can't be here because they are the real deal. Now, however, let's deal with this thing. We have to flip the script on the world and change the profile of the church. In other words, what the church must keep in mind is that in all areas of compassion, we must become the leaders. Just like we have first responders who handle worldly things, such as the police and fire, should there also be first responders from the Lord's church when it comes to spiritual things? Think about it. Just like the police and fire departments, if there is a disaster in the community that happens to the neighbors, shouldn't we be the first ones in our neighborhood to respond? Oh, amen. Now, I'm just telling you. Amen. The truth, from a spiritual standpoint, we should be the first ones on the scene helping the community. See, for example, if somebody's in, in, in bereavement and you're in the neighborhood, Shouldn't we be the first one to take, uh, bring them some food to take off that burden? Yes. While they are grieving? Yes. Should we be the first one? Yes. They shouldn't even have to worry about turning on their stove. Huh? Yes. Should have to worry about running out and going to Popeyes, anything like that. We are Popeyes. Yes. Yes. For them, amen now. Yes. It ain't hard for you to get some chicken and a biscuit for somebody, amen now. Yes. That ain't a hard thing for you to do. See, if somebody's in the hospital, which I was in recently, and you know who came to see me? A Catholic chaplain didn't know what he was talking about from Adam. Now, why is he the one representing Christ? Hmm? Why is he the one at my bedside trying to encourage me? Hmm? Where were we? Where was the church? Why well, I gotta hear somebody 
that came from India, huh, I'm talking about he came 14,000 miles. Oh, amen, y'all. And y'all 14 miles away. Yeah. Amen. I ain't fussing at you. I'm talking about anybody. Yeah, We're supposed to be what? The first responders. Yeah, We're supposed to be at each other's bedside in the community. It's bedside. Amen, y'all. Yeah. If you're a neighbor to somebody, why not be neighborly? Amen. Whether he's a Christian or not, right? We ought to be showing up by his bedside. We ought to beat the chaplain there. Amen, y'all. We ought to know he's there before the chaplain even know. Amen. Amen. Going there and sharing Christ and the love of Christ. Because why? We're the first responders. Not these fake organizations. Not fake churches and all these kind of things. We have to change the profile of the church. Now think about it. If somebody is starving, should we have the ability to mobilize food to send to the hungry during their time? Of need. I'm so glad to see the existence of Church of Christ Relief Fund right now. Amen. That they are actually have semi trucks that are going across the country Amen. helping hurricane victims Amen. and all that kind of stuff. Amen. And if you know why that's possible, it's because of the contributions of several congregations at one time. Let me tell you something we don't have no Vatican. Huh? We don't have no church council. So we're not funneling money through a headquarters. So that gives some folk an advantage. But one thing that we have, we got God. And we can organize individual congregations. Huh? Put that money together. And then we're mobilizing food in Africa. We're mobilizing food in the United States. We're mobilizing food in Kansas. Because why? We're cooperating together. That's another thing that we as a church, as a whole, we got to get out of our silos. Yes, there's such things as autonomy, but at the same time, when you read 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6, and verse number 7, which we just did, and you read 1 Corinthians 16, verse 1, and verse number 2, when you look at the context of what Paul was doing, Paul was going around from congregation to congregation collecting money. We use that for the local congregation, but what he was doing was raising money by all the Lord's church to help the poor saints in Jerusalem. So he was going to other countries, other nations, in order to what? Feed the poor Christians in Jerusalem. So obviously then, in order to change the profile of the church, to become that national organization that we have to uh, become, First, we got to cooperate with our own. Make sure we take care of our own congregation. Making sure we're all taking care of not only the congregation, but our community, whether Christian or not. Then we have to link up each congregation together, just like Paul did, pull money together, and raise the visibility of the church. And at the same time, what? We're helping those in need, and we're giving what? God the glory. That's the Bible way of doing things. So again, we should be there first. Now, what we're talking about here today is starting from the bottom up, not from the top down. What I mean by that is now, every one of us got the power to get this started. Every one of us as an individual has the ability to start mobilizing for Christ Jesus. Are y'all ready for that? Are you ready to look out for the next person in your life that you're able to help and respond accordingly? Think about it. We should be there first as individuals. When it comes to one-on-one -on -one help, we can provide for the suffering and the poor. We should be the first responders when it comes to the congregation organizing formal efforts. To help the disadvantaged as the church did with the widows in Acts chapter number 6. We should be the first responders who band together as several congregations unite to meet the needs of the poor as the first century church did in Paul's time. Who again was going from congregation to congregation raising money for the poor saints in Jerusalem. And lastly, we should have the mentality that we the church should be at the forefront of it all. 
We should not let people who do not know Christ do more than us. Man. So start considering what you can do to change the world immediately around you. Even if there's compassion shown to just one neighbor at a time. You see, if each one reach one, then the Church of Christ will be more well known than these secular organizations. And the needy will think of us before they think about anybody else. We can do it, y'all. But remember, it's just going to start with the one in the seat. I'm talking about your seat. My seat. It starts from one, then what? It multiplies. It takes over the congregation. Then it takes over, con takes over congregations in the region. Takes over congregations in the nation. Then it takes over congregations in the world. And then our profile will be that we truly are the Lord's church. So think about that. Think about how you personally can make a difference right now. Because if you make a difference with one person, you've already changed the world. May God bless and keep you. The message is yours. You're a child of God. And you walk disorderly. It's time to be restored to God's fold by repentance, confession, and prayer. You know, that's a very simple way of saying that if you're willing to change, confess your fault to God, come clean with him, ask him to forgive you, he's going to do it right then and there. You see that in Acts 8, verse 22, in 1 John 1, 7 to verse number 10. But if you're not a child of God, you have to understand that this is the most important decision of your life. This, this decision that you're going to make is more important than air in your lungs, more important than food in your belly, more important than a job and a roof over your head. Because all those things are temporary, and eventually they're going to pass away from you anyway. What God has to offer you is eternal. That's what the Bible says in John 3, verse number 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have what church? Everlasting life. That life is so grand that God told us about it. In Revelation 21, verse 4, talking about the heavenly glory, that state of eternity for all of God saved, saved where he said there'll be no more crying, dying, pain, no sorrow. And God is going to wipe away all tears from the saints' eyes. Could you imagine that type of existence where you get up and you don't age anymore? Amen, y'all. Where you get up and you have no aches and no, no pains. You get up and there's no Walgreens neighborhood pharmacy because you no longer need medicine to keep that old engine of yours going. Amen, y'all. Don't you want that forever? See, the longer you live, the more help you're going to need. Amen. Amen. That's me and the brothers were joking a little bit earlier today. I said, man. And one of the brothers said to me, every decade in your life, something changed. He did not lie. <laughs> Unto me. I didn't have too much trouble in life until my 40s. Amen. <laughs> if God let me see the 50s, Lord help me. I don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> when the 50s and the 40s is like this right now. Amen, y'all. That's a humorous way of saying that we're all going where we started. We're going back to the dust, y'all. God took us from the dust and going to return us to the dust. Like the Hebrew writer told us that it's appointed once for man to die, then after that, the judge meant. The only thing that is guaranteed to us is eternal life through Jesus Christ. That's it. Tomorrow is not promised to you today. That's why the book of James tells us our life is like a vapor, meaning like steam is here one minute and gone the next. Smoke is here. You can see it for two seconds. Then what happens? That smoke is gone. That's a proper symbolism of teaching from God to show you that even your life is just a drop in the bucket. It's here one minute and gone the next. And think about it, you don't know how long you're going to live. Only God knows that. Your doctors don't know how long you're going to live. None of those things. You could be gone tonight, and then your eternity is sealed. But it's not sealed the way you want it to be sealed. Amen, y'all. In other words, you have to make that decision right here in your earthly existence in order to 
to be saved. There is no salvation after you close your eyes Amen. for the last time in this life. That's why I take this time out. I know a lot of times people be ready to go, but that's all right. Y'all sit here for a minute. Because we're talking about that which is eternal. We're trying to save a soul, even if it's just one. The elements, I'm talking about heaven, is going to rejoice if just one person on the entire planet becomes a Christian for his salvation. That's how serious God takes salvation. And so serious, you have to take it. Think about it this way, too. You only have one soul, and you only have one opportunity to save it. Why would you take a risk and walk out of here unsaved here today? Because it's truly a risk, and it's high risk, because your eternity will not change after you die. But you've heard the foundation already, believe it or not. You've heard John 3, verse 16, that Jesus is the Son of God. And what he did for you affects your salvation. That he died nearly 2,000 years ago on a cruel cross of Calvary. And he did it because he saw we were drowning in our sins. That's what Hebrews chapter 8 and chapter 10 is talking about. When Jesus tells God the Father in heaven, a body you have prepared for me. He says, sacrifice and offering the blood of bulls and goats never took away man's sins. In other words, you can't earn salvation. No matter what you do, you can't earn it on your own. You have to have the assistance, the cleansing power, the guilt reducing and taking away blood of Christ Man. in order to be saved. In other words, that's why Romans 3.23 and Romans 6.23 is written. Well, the Bible says all have sinned, including myself, and fallen short of the glory of God. The glory of God means the exalted state of God, the absolute moral perfection of God. We all have fallen short of it. And since we are falling short of the absolute moral perfection it takes to get into heaven, God had to send a remedy for our sins. That's why he wrote Romans 6 verse 23 that the wages of sin is death. He's talking about hell. He said, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. You notice God calls eternal life a gift. That gift is that Jesus and going back to Hebrews, he offered his body on the cross of Calvary, so your soul does not have to perish in eternal punishment. And guess what happened after God, uh, Jesus got off that cross? Think about it. When Jesus was on the cross, he said the final words. He said, it is finished. In other words, he paid the price for our sins. The guilt of our sins was placed on him and taken out on him. On the cross of Calvary, so God doesn't take it out on us on the judgment day. That's what Jesus did for us. He took the punishment of our sins, and God the Father, symbolically speaking, was saying after Jesus died, that's enough. If you will accept that sacrifice and do what my son says, I'm not going to hold it against you. That's the mentality God has for you right now. And that's why he sent that remedy. He sent that solution called his son dying on the cross so that you can have a chance at eternal life. Amen. I hope you believe that. Because if you believe, you'll respond to the rest of what you have to do to be saved. Amen. Believe first that Jesus, the Son of God, has suffered, died, and rose again, that you may have a chance at eternal life. Then you have to put your faith in practice. That's the next part of the plan of salvation is the practicing of what you believe. That's what Jesus, that's why Jesus said in Luke chapter 13, verse 3 and verse number 5, he says, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. perish. Repenting is a way of saying practice the Christian religion. In other words, live righteously and leave a sinful lifestyle alone. In other words, once you become a Christian, you didn't come to become a hypocritical Christian. You came to become a real Christian. 
from the very beginning. See, if I can be honest and true with you as an adult, I know you're ready to go, but hold on for just a second. That's why Joe Osteen don't tell you this. That's why T.D. Jakes don't tell you this. That's why uh, Joyce Meyer, Jimmy Swagger, uh, Billy Graham, Graham's son, Franklin Graham, they won't tell you this because people don't want to practice the faith. But Jesus says you have to practice the faith. And that's what repentance is. It's evidence that you are a true Christian and not a hypocrite. That's what it means to repent. After repent, now this is still part of what you must do to practice the faith for salvation. Jesus says you've got to confess him on earth, that he is the Lord. You see that Romans 10, verse 9 and verse number 10. Well, the Bible says with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Amen. And just so we don't get it wrong, God gave us an example. I have to call it, he gave us a visual in Acts chapter 8, verse 37. Before the Ethiopian eunuch became a Christian, he had to make the confession required by an inspired man of God named Philip. He said the man could be baptized if he believed. And in response to that, the Ethiopian eunuch, before he was a Christian, said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He had to say that not with his heart, but with his mouth. That's what Romans 10 is talking about. With the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. And lastly, in regards to becoming a Christian, part of practicing your faith that's absolutely necessary is that you have to be baptized for the remission, meaning the forgiveness of your sins. He said in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, where the Bible says, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. I'm paraphrasing it here. For the what? Remission of your sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So obviously then, before you're forgiven, before you're a Christian, and before you're saved, God says you must obey the command to be baptized in order to be saved. Amen. Baptism has another benefit to it. Not just forgiveness of sin, but it also does something else. Paul also told us in Galatians 3, verse number 27, that those who have been baptized have been baptized into Christ. Being in Christ is the same thing as being in the body. Being in the body is the same thing as a member of the church. And being a member of the church is the same thing as being a part of God's family. So the other benefit, other than uh, uh, washing away your sins, is that baptism puts you in the family of God. That's when you become truly a child of God. And lastly, Mark 16, verse 16 tells you the other benefit of baptism. Jesus said himself, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. So you got to understand this. You can't get around baptism. So to make it very short and, and simple and plain, God's plan of salvation is here in the word of God, which you've already heard. Believe in it. Talking about Jesus being the way to salvation. The son of almighty God. The only solution for your sins. You have to not only hear the word, believe it, but you got to repent of your sins. In other words, take on a Christian lifestyle, live him righteously. You must confess Jesus with your mouth that he is the Son of God, being your Lord, and take him on in baptism where you go down your old self, but you rise a new person. All your sins spiritually will be cast away in the blood of Jesus Christ. God calls that washing away in the blood of Christ. Then after that, you've got to continue what you have done. Every Christian in this room know that we're under Revelation 2, verse number 10. And we have to obey that until the judgment day, the end of our lives. This is what Jesus talks about. He says, be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. You know what faithfulness means. You know exactly what faithfulness means. If you're a husband, you know what a faithful wife is, right? Amen. She is devoted to you, and she's not going off with no other man. Amen. Amen. And vice versa. 
The same thing is true when it comes to Christ and your relationship as a child of God. Amen. Remember, Revelation teaches us that we are the bride of Christ. And so we have to stay faithful to him unto our deaths in order to be saved. That means keep believing, obeying, doing everything we just talked about. Keep believing, obeying him unto the end. And heaven's going to be your home. We're just going to sing a song of invitation that gives you an opportunity to come down that aisle. Give me your hand, God, your heart. Don't you dare be shamed to come down that aisle. Because the last thing I didn't tell you is Matthew 10, verse 33. Where Jesus said, if you uh, uh, won't confess me before men, him will I not confess before my Father God in heaven. In other words, if you shame a him, he's going to be shaming you on the judgment day, which is not going to be good for you or anybody that's in that status. Don't worry about folk looking at you. Don't worry about what you got to suffer when you leave here. Worry about what you got to suffer if you don't become a Christian. Amen. That's what matters in the end. Well, sing that song. That'll give you an opportunity to come down that aisle. I'm just going to ask you very simply, very quick and easy. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Confirm your faith. We'll go down in the water grave of baptism so you can start practicing your faith for the remission of your sins and your salvation if you stay faithful unto death. Won't you come in together? We stand and sing that Lord's invitation. Won't you come? Now, this is your opportunity. Don't let it pass you by.